Good afternoon, everyone. We're very lucky to have with us today Mr. Gary Warren. Mr. I like the background music. <laughs> Mr. Gary Boren is the chair of Wilbur Hale's International Arbitration Practice Group. He is widely regarded as the world's leading authority on international commercial arbitration and international litigation. He has been ranked for the past 20 years as one of the world's leading international arbitration practitioners and the leading arbitration practitioner in London. Mr. Boren has participated in more than 600 international arbitrations including four of the largest ICC arbitrations and several of the most significant ad hoc arbitrations in recent history. Mr. Bourne is uniformly ranked by Euromoney, Chambers, Legal 500, and Global Council as one of the world's, as one of the leading practitioners in the field. He is one of only two lawyers in the world and the only lawyer in London to receive global start status and Chambers rankings for international arbitration. Mr. Bourne has published a number of leading works on international arbitration, the most popular of which is International Commercial Arbitration, which we have all read. Um, he, is, <laughs> he currently sits as the president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center and is a member of the advisory board of the HKIAC, among others. So without further ado, let's all give a warm round of applause to Mr. Gary Bourne. Thank you, Camille. Um, you can take everything she said with a huge grain of salt. When she said you'd all read international commercial arbitration, that sort of gave the game away. She's exaggerating wildly about, about that. I don't think anybody, including me, has probably read the whole thing. Um, and therefore, all her other very kind comments about me probably are equally exaggerated. Um, thank you all uh, for coming. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk about our favorite subject, international commercial arbitration. I guess we have a problem with the slide deck, though. Um, it doesn't seem like it's international commercial arbitration. It looks like television or Game of Thrones or something. Why? Why have we come to the wrong, the wrong session? We're going to look at how winter is coming. The Game of Thrones, a speech which I've given on other occasions, is a model, a paradigm for our favorite subject, international commercial arbitration. Now, you all know, I'm sure, the Game of Thrones, but in case you missed episode 10 or 7 or 2 of the most recent season, let's do a quick recap. <laughs> The Game of Thrones involves a fantasy world, a fantasy world of seven kingdoms, Westeros. And those seven kingdoms, for a long, harmonious, peaceful summer, lived happily, constructively. The people traded in free and open marketplaces. They lived peacefully, without conflict, without war. It was a golden age, an age of peace and commercial enterprise. And in a sense, as we'll see, that's like international arbitration. But, as the main character in Game of Thrones always warned, winter is coming. Ned Stark, the king of one of the seven kingdoms, warned that a long, cold winter on the other side of the wall that protected the seven peaceful, harmonious kingdoms. A long, dark winter was coming. In large part because an army of dead were rising on the other side of the wall, led by the other. An army that wanted to tear down the wall, go across the wall and destroy the peaceful villages and harmonious marketplaces that existed there. Why is that? How is that like international arbitration? You are no doubt wondering. <coughs> international arbitration has known a 
long, harmonious, golden summer. It's actually known thousands of summers in a sense. You can trace international commercial arbitration to <coughs> thousands of years before Christ. Cuneiform tablets in what's present day Iraq describe arbitral awards in disputes between merchants, between landowners in the ancient Middle East. In the medieval ages in Europe, arbitration was used to resolve commercial disputes between merchants at trade fairs and otherwise. Arbitration just wasn't just used in Europe, but was also used all around the world. It was used in villages in India and China. It was used by village elders in Africa to settle commercial disputes and other types of disputes as well. That use of arbitration, that beginning of a long golden summer, reached its climax, in a sense, in 1958 with the negotiation of the New York Convention. At first, the Convention, which, as you know from your courses, provides the global constitutional charter for international commercial arbitration. That convention wasn't popular in particular at first. Relatively few states acceded to it. But over time, nearly 165 states around the world have ratified, have acceded to the New York Convention. And the convention, as the constitutional charter for international commercial arbitration, guarantees that agreements to arbitrate, international arbitration agreements, will be recognized and enforced in all those countries around the world. And by the same token, arbitral awards will be recognized and enforced in each case, subject only to very limited exceptions. It's not just the New York Convention that has attracted, during this long golden summer of international arbitration, the support of countries all around the world, the ICSID Convention. Convention, so-called Washington Convention, establishing the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes has also nearly 165 contracting states around the world. National governments have not just ratified the New York Convention and thus recognized the fundamental importance of international arbitration as a means of resolving disputes. They've also enacted arbitration legislation, in many cases based on the Institutional Model Law on International and Commercial Arbitration. Nearly 100 jurisdictions around the world have adopted some version of the Model Law. And in many states, even where the Model Law has not been adopted, pro-arbitration, national arbitration statutes give effect to the New York Convention and implement the global constitutional charter for international arbitration. That legal framework, in a sense, is the wall, the basis for the long golden summer of international arbitration. It provides the foundation by which businesses and people can resolve their disputes by arbitration. And that is, in fact, what people have done. Arbitral institutions all around the world, in every part of the globe, in all the places that have ratified the New York Convention or the ICSI Convention have established arbitral institutions to administer international arbitrations. Those institutions have reported, and you can see this on the slide over the last 30 years or so, stunning growth in the number of disputes that are referred to arbitration. Just looking at a small selection of these arbitral institutions, you can see the caseload rising progressively and robustly over the last three decades. Arbitration is often referred to in surveys by businesses as their preferred means of resolving international commercial disputes. That's true in every economic sector. It's true in the sale of goods. It's true in mining. It's true in the energy sector. It's true today even in many areas where historically arbitration was not used. It's not just that the 
numbers of arbitrations have increased and the size of the disputes which are arbitrated have increased. The types of disputes that are arbitrated have also become much more diverse. The diversity has, has increased. Businesses use arbitration to resolve their largest disputes. The UCOS arbitration, for example, resulted in an award of $50 billion. There's a construction arbitration on foot in Europe with claims in excess of $30 billion. Companies refer their largest and most important disputes to arbitration, but they also refer their smallest and most mundane disputes to arbitration because that process, the arbitral process, is so flexible and capable of dealing with different types of disputes, whether between large multinationals or just ordinary farmers, ordinary merchants. Arbitration is used to resolve, as I said previously, entire categories of disputes that historically were not subject to arbitration. The Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland, resolves sports disputes without it. The Olympics wouldn't be run in the way that we know it. And you can see its caseload over the last 30 years or so rising dramatically and the importance of those disputes to the fabric of international sports law can't be overstated. Intellectual property disputes, which also were not historically subject to arbitration, now have their own specialized arbitral institution, wipe of the World Intellectual Property Organization, also in Switzerland, which, as you can see, resolves significant numbers of intellectual property disputes, patent disputes, trademark disputes, copyright disputes, other IP disputes. Investment disputes, disputes between host states and foreign investors. Under the ICSID convention or under one of the 3,000 or so bilateral investment treaties that states have concluded over the past 40 years or so, also are resolved in increasing numbers. You can see those numbers on the current slide. ICSID had a caseload 30, 35 years ago of 0.1 case a year or so. And today, you can see 50 cases or so. New cases are filed each year, and in total, nearly 600 investment arbitrations resolving some of the most difficult issues of public international law uh, have been issued by ICSID tribunals. It has truly been a long golden summer, just like in the Game of Thrones, just like in Westeros, but also just like in Westeros. <laughs> Beyond the wall, there are those who would tear down that system, destroy that legal framework, undo all it is that 165 states have cooperated to build in the last 40 years and that businesses and ordinary people use every day. That army of the undead takes a variety of forms. It began with investment arbitration. The Osgood Declaration attacked investment arbitration on multiple grounds. Attacked investment arbitration as being confidential, occurring behind closed doors, as being biased because businesses had an opportunity to participate in the selection of the arbitral tribunal, of lacking appellate mechanisms, of being inconsistent, producing awards that were difficult to reconcile, of not taking proper account of state interests, infringing on the regulatory space of states. Their suggestion, their proposal, their demand was to tear down the framework of 3,000 bilateral investment treaties to denounce the Exit Convention. And indeed, that happened. In Venezuela, other states adopting precisely that rationale, precisely that rhetoric, denounced their sessions to the Exit Convention and began either not to conclude bilateral investment treaties or to denounce or not to renew those treaties. Not just in Venezuela, but other countries in Europe, the United States, criticisms of investment arbitration grew more shrill. The Trans-Pacific Partnership with its investment arbitration provisions was subject to harsh criticism, as was TPP on this side of the Pacific. 
It is not just criticisms, though, of investment arbitration, not just the demands to get rid of wholesale, get rid of investment arbitration, but also criticisms, harsh criticisms of international commercial arbitration. And when you think about it, the critiques that are made of investment arbitration apply often just as fully to international commercial arbitration as to investment arbitration. It's often confidential. It often has no appellate mechanism. It often is subject to criticisms for producing inconsistent decisions. It involves party-nominated co-arbitrators. All the criticisms that one sees in the Osgood Declaration can be applied as well to international commercial arbitration. And indeed, albeit in a piecemeal fashion. They have Lord Thomas in this country. Other voices in other countries have demanded greater appellate review. In some countries, de novo appellate review of arbitral awards, which would, in many ways, do the same thing to international commercial arbitration that the criticisms of investment arbitration would do to that type of dispute resolution. It is, in many ways, a wholesale assault, a wholesale attack on international arbitration in every form, investment arbitration, commercial arbitration, state-to-state -state arbitration. What is one to do? What is one to say in response? We have to look to guidance. We can look to Tyrion in the Game of Thrones, but for once, I'm afraid. He has little to tell us. He's distracted with other things. So we'll have to change shows. <laughs> Where can we look for guidance? If not the Game of Thrones, then the House of Cards. And we'll focus on what Claire says just today. Claire, I'm sure, would agree that there are two kinds of people in the world, those who hunt and those who are hunted. Arbitration has been hunted. International arbitration has been hunted for the last five years. And we have reacted. Those in the arbitration community have reacted to the attacks. They have, and you can see the decision here from a Canadian court which points out some of the important, some of the fundamental benefits of arbitration. It points out those reasons why 165 states over 50 years have progressively acceded to both the New York Convention and the ICSID Convention. And it points out why international arbitration is the preferred means for resolving international commercial and investment disputes. It points out that in a sense, one can summarize these, these benefits, which the court refers to on the slide, as the five E's. Arbitration is more efficient, more expeditious, more expert, more even-handed, and more enforceable, the five E's, than the available alternative. It's more efficient because it doesn't use a one-size-fits-all set of procedural rules imposed in every case, irrespective of the needs of the parties, the particularities of the case. Instead, procedures are hand-tailored to particular parties, particular disputes, which is, as you can well know, as you can well imagine, particularly important in international disputes where there are differing procedural expectations and differing procedural challenges, language, distance of witnesses, and other challenges. Arbitration is more efficient because it can tailor its procedures and it's more expeditious for the same reason. And because arbitration does not involve de novo review, at least today, unless Lord Thomas has his way, arbitration is not subject to endless cycles of appeals, which in some countries can take not months but years. And because lawyers like taxi cabs are paid by the hour, or the moment, the minute, that ultimately results in significant cost savings. 
for those reasons. Arbitration is more efficient and more expeditious. It's also more expert for many of the same reasons. The parties choose a tribunal for a particular case. If it's a construction case, they choose a construction expert, an insurance case, an insurance expert. A joint venture case in Oman, an Omani lawyer specializing in joint ventures and <coughs> the subject matter of the joint venture may be. Choosing tribunal members based upon the needs of the parties and the character of the dispute instead of a one-size-fits-all standing panel of decision makers provides substantial benefits in terms of expertise. Arbitration ultimately, at least in the international context, is also substantially more even-handed. We all know how ordinary international litigations are conducted. Party A sues Party B in Party A's home state, State A. Party B sues Party A in Party B's home state, State B. They both pursue parallel proceedings and fight about jurisdiction forum selection, choice of law. And ultimately, they fight unsuccessfully, each having won in his or her own home court recognition of foreign judgments. The only good news for party A when it loses in state B is that state B's judgment isn't enforceable against it anywhere but state B. And the same goes for party B. Arbitration provides an even-handed International arbitration provides an even-handed means of international dispute resolution because of, instead of each party suing in its own home courts on its own home turf, one resolves the dispute in a neutral, objective, and independent tribunal, which both parties participate in selecting and which a neutral arbitral institution ultimately <coughs> constitutes and makes decisions with regard to challenges and appointments of arbitrators if parties cannot agree. And ultimately, the results in the arbitration, the expeditious, expert, and even handed arbitration are enforceable. The New York Convention that we looked at previously ensures both that arbitration agreements, unlike form selection agreements, and arbitral awards, unlike national court judgments, can be recognized around the world. The results of that decision-making process are enforceable. And those are the reasons that 165 states or so have acceded to the New York Convention and adopted pro-arbitration national arbitration statutes. And those are the reasons that businesses look to arbitration to resolve their disputes, because it has those advantages compared to the alternatives. But in a sense, that's that's the hunt, hunted part of the story. That's the defense. It explains why arbitration isn't so bad after all. It explains how it has some procedural benefit. There's a more fundamental reason, though, that arbitration isn't just procedurally desirable, but good. This is the Constitution of Year 3 in the French Republic. It guaranteed in some of its most important articles, in addition to guaranteeing equality, liberty, and fraternity, the right to arbitrate. It provided that the right of the citizens to resolve their dispute by arbitrators of their choice would not be infringed. That was a fundamentally important principle, not just for the French Republic, but for all of us. It's fundamentally important because in free democratic societies. The rule of law ensures that we all, we can choose the relationships we enter into. We can choose who we contract with and how. We can choose who we marry and how. We can choose who we worship with and how. We can decide what relationships we want to pursue. All relationships, any of those that I mentioned and others are imperfect. They all have problems. They all need to be fixed. They all give rise to disputes. Just as important to the freedom to make relationships is the freedom to mend 
relationships. And that is the ultimate wisdom in the French Republic's guarantee of the right to arbitrate, the right of free citizens to decide how they want to mend their relationships and resolve their disputes. That is no less important an aspect of the rule of law than the other guarantees of individual rights. Now, unfortunately, not long after the French Republic's constitution of year one, the Napoleonic Code came into force. And Napoleon, an autocrat, had different views about how the disputes of French citizens should be resolved. They should be resolved only in French courts by judges chosen by the French state by ultimately Napoleon. An authoritarian view of the rights of citizens and of how to resolve disputes. This case, the Prunier versus Alliance case, applied the Napoleonic Code and held invalid an agreement to arbitrate future disputes. And for the next 60 years in France, from 1848 until the Geneva Protocol in the 1920s, arbitration was seldom used. It was a hiccup in that golden summer we talked about. But with the Geneva Protocol and then the New York Convention and subsequently the French Code of Civil Procedure, France returned to the affirmations that he had recognized in the Constitution of Year One. It wasn't just a French story that followed that narrative. Same thing happened across the border in Germany. In the 1870s, Prussian Code of Civil Procedure, other provincial codes in Germany guaranteed the efficacy of the arbitral process, gave effect to agreements to arbitrate and arbitral awards. These, though, the Reich's directives on arbitration from the 1930s did the opposite. Following the National Socialists' approach towards society, towards government, they decreed that arbitration would not be used. They held, they reasoned, that arbitration interfered with the National Socialist conception of the state. Like Napoleon, their vision was that free citizens couldn't be left to resolve disputes between themselves, couldn't be left to mend their relationships, and that only the state, the judges appointed by the state, could do so. Fortunately, in subsequent years, in the German Constitution, a little like the Constitution of Year Three, returned to the visions of the French Republic. It guaranteed, in Article 2.1, the rights of personal autonomy, the same sorts of rights that are fundamental to all of us being able to choose the relationships we make and how we mend them. And that provision, Article 2.1 of the German Grundgesetz, the German Constitution, is invoked by German courts, both the Federal Labor Court and the German Supreme Court, specifically as the basis for giving effect to arbitration agreements, recognizing that agreements to arbitrate are manifestations of individual autonomy. Precisely the same notion. The right of free citizens to resolve disputes arising out of their relationships in the manner that they choose. The same approach has been taken in other jurisdictions around the world. The United States and Panama and elsewhere. So what is to be done? What is to be done is to recognize what this assault on international arbitration is. It's not just something, not just something that undermines the fabric of international trade and investment. It surely does that. The whole reason for the New York Convention is to encourage international trade. The whole reason for the Exit Convention is to encourage international investment. And the tax on international arbitration are also attacks on international trade and investment, and they're bad for that reason. But they are worse for another reason. They are worse because they attack the very conception of the rule of law. They attack the notion of free citizens 
choosing what relationships they wish to make and how they wish to fix those relationships when things go wrong. Thank you. So, that's done. Now we can do questions. Sounds 
been a list to me, but the idea was that I think it was Argentina. Uruguay. Yeah. Uruguay, okay, which uh, took uh, measures for uh, restrict uh, advertisement of tobacco products. And the tobacco company claimed that it was expropriation of its investment in its trademark portfolio. And as I understood, the idea was uh, that Uruguay was actually aiming on protecting uh, health of its citizens and it was international obligations. And to what extent international arbitration can look into this issue mm -hmm. when, the, when the state takes certain measures to improve uh, ecology standards which mm -hmm. were absent when the investment came to a specific state or to regulate some, I don't know, alcohol production or something mm -hmm. similar. But maybe more about ecology because I think in the developing states the standards for ecological protection are lower than in the developed states. So, in speaking of alcohol, there will be drinks when we're done with this <laughs> um, a couple, a couple threads to, to an answer, and then you can weave them together in whatever way you, you, you think best. First, it, it, I think it's very clear that, that investment arbitration, and, and perhaps more specifically investment law, protects human rights. Um, it protects against expropriation of property. The right to property is a fundamental human right. It's one of the safeguards against arbitrary state action, the guarantee that people can have their own property. It protects the right to fair and regular judicial proceedings, denial of justice, and other um, guarantees similar to guarantees against the denial of justice, guarantees against denials of fair and equitable treatment, where states engage in arbitrary actions that hurt foreigners in, in particular ways. And in that sense, investment law is very much like customary international law, which protected foreigners, aliens, against various types of governmental abuses. That is a core aspect of international human rights. And investment arbitration does that. It's indeed the heart of what investment arbitration is. It is also true that in doing that, it sometimes comes in tension with other protections for different human rights, including rights to health, education, water, um, environmental protection, and the like. And it is right, because international law needs to evolve and develop, that those competing tensions and concerns get taken into account. They get taken into account both by arbitral tribunals. Philip Morris lost both its cases. It lost the Uruguay and it lost the Australian case. And indeed had to pay legal fees to the states that it brought claims against. Those tribunals recognized, in the case of the Uruguay Award, explicitly the, government, the importance of the government protecting public health. One of the arbitrators dissented, but the majority of the tribunal gave resounding affirmation to the importance of protections for health and, and safety. It's not just arbitral tribunals that recognize those, those rights um, in, in their substantive decisions, but also procedurally. Arbitral tribunals, investment arbitration tribunals, allow NGOs and others to make amicus curiae submissions, whether it's the, the EU and bilateral investment cases, the World Health Organization and the Uruguay case, uh, clean water initiatives in a case called Bywater Gulf versus Tanzania and numerous other cases where there are procedural avenues for spokespersons for those types of human rights to, to be heard and their views get taken into account in the decision making. Most importantly though in a sense, it is ultimately the states who decide as they make international law and they make bilateral investment treaties what precisely the protections for these various <coughs> human rights are, what precisely the trade-offs are between expropriate guarantees against expropriation and denials of fair and equitable treatment and protections for the environment or health. They renegotiate their bilateral investment treaties and multiple states have. They change their model bilateral <coughs> investment treaties in order to make more specific 
the protections, sometimes limiting them, sometimes expanding them, and also to ensure that particular areas, environment, health, what have you, get taken into account. And that is the ultimate safeguard. The estates conclude <coughs> that these protections should be recognized. They do so. And arbitral tribunals do as well. Next question. Uh, in the very back. And then over here. Thank you, Mr. Born. I'm not a big fan of the voice head winters coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's also concerned me because attack on arbitration is also attack for my colleagues and me as well. So, is there any attack about the, how the arbitrators outside the tribunal behave, maybe like moral torpedoes or misdemeanor misdemeanor behavior? Because they will always compare with the court, the judge in court, the judge in court. They always like disciplinary actions who against the misdemeanor behavior. Thank you. Um, I think that's a good point. I'm trying to trying to think of the very one of the interesting things about arbitration is is to compare the incidence of serious complaints about behavior of arbitrators, international arbitrators, especially in investment arbitrations, on the one hand, with complaints about, about national court judges on the other. Transparency International has done very interesting studies on, on corruption in, in um, international life. And sadly, one of the areas of governmental affairs that is most subject to corruption or judicial proceedings. One can look at Transparency International reports over the last decade and, and there's some, particularly in some parts of the world, some, some, some very disturbing figures in terms of the, the frequency with which people report um, either experiencing or, or being offered um, opportunities for, for corruption. One sees very little of that in, in all the various cases that, that Camille described that, that I've done, I have never seen, I've never seen an incident of, of corruption. I've seen parties that are unhappy, parties who think that the tribunal reached a, a wrong conclusion, or a very bad conclusion, but I have never seen anything that's smacks of, of corruption. Now, certainly there, there must be such cases, nothing, nothing in the world is, is perfect, but I think it, I think your point is a good one. It is, it's always important to, to compare um, the two things that are, that are in, in, in competition, national courts or international courts for that matter, and arbitration on the other hand. I think there was a question in the back here. Thanks. Uh, so one of the, we received an article uh, which was circulated by our office uh, before we came here, about probably a similar talk that was given in the past. And uh, there was a comment in that article that you feel that uh, the 2006 amendment to the model law is something that uh, you feel very strongly against. Uh, to use a Game of Thrones reference, it's almost like you feel that Tywin Lannister replacing Tyrion as the Hand of the King was really not a good idea. Can <laughs> you elaborate on why? Um, the, the 2006 amendments um, don't fall into the, the general category of, of winter is coming. It's more on the level of, of technical complaints by a nerdy lawyer about what other nerdy lawyers did. Um, what, what really upsets me about the 2006 amendments to the Institute of Model Law is the drafting styles and so much of substance. There's not, to be honest, much substance to them. Um, but the drafting style, when you look at Article 17, which I think is broken into like, eight or nine subparts, 17A, 17B, and which takes up literally as much space as the rest of the model law to deal with that extraordinarily topical subject of provisional measures in international arbitration, it seems to imbalance the otherwise perfect symmetry of the model law. Um, the the I, more seriously, the, the 2006 amendments to the model law, I think, are an indication of how international arbitration has, during the long golden summer, continually tried to develop and improve itself. It's, it's not just the model law that is, is revised, um, but also institutional arbitration rules. Every arbitral institution revises its rules based on feedback from users 
every few years at the Singapore International Arbitration Center, where I had the privilege of, of being the, the president. We revised our 2013 rules um, just, just this year and um, adopted a variety of, of new measures, as did other institutions around the world. These, these measures introduce new aspects of international arbitration that didn't previously exist, provisions for, for example, consolidation, intervention, and, and joinder, provisions that are aimed at making the arbitral process more efficient, provisions for emergency arbitrators, which didn't exist five, ten years ago. Um, whereby now one can, in the space of literally two or three days, have an emergency arbitrator make an emergency ruling on requests for truly urgent provisional measures. Colleagues of mine here at, at this law firm sought and obtained such measures two or three days ago in, in a proceeding that lasted less, less than a week. But it's an example of how international arbitration develops and improves itself. You can find other examples in, in, in the same vein. There are provisions for early dismissal, provisions for expedited procedures whereby smaller disputes are resolved extremely quickly today in, in six months if they're less than, than in, in the case of the SIAC rules, less than around five million US dollars. And so just as the 2006 amendments to the model law, even if I criticize their, their drafting style and how they interfere with the symmetry of the model law, were a good faith effort to improve the arbitral process. Perhaps not as effective as these changes to institutional arbitration rules, but nonetheless a serious effort to improve. That's not what um, the critics of, of international arbitration, that's not what those beyond the law are seeking to do. They're seeking to tear down that system, not to improve it. Yes, in the back. Sir, uh, if I can summarize this discussion relating to the kind of competition between the national courts and international courts and international arbitration. So, I think uh, a courts, by way of publishing their judgments, by demonstrating that justice is being done, are able to gain more trust than these arbitration proceedings where since there is less of publication, there is less of demonstration what goes inside and what comes after all. Maybe this is one reason why arbitration is not able to attract trust from the international community and that's why we are facing this situation. There are three things wrong with that argument. The first thing that's wrong with that argument is that if you look at the real facts in terms of international commercial arbitration, the opposite is the case. Why is it that those numbers have gone from 1,000 to 5,000, just picking a few institutions? Why is it that ICSID's case load has gone from 0.1 to 50 cases a year? Why is it that businesses consistently report that their preferred means of international dispute resolution is international arbitration, notwithstanding the historic confidentiality of arbitral awards? Businesses have more trust than in international arbitration than they do in national courts. Second point, in fact, in investment arbitration in recent years, the proceedings have not been confidential and the awards have been published. Investment arbitrations are in many ways today more transparent than many national court proceedings. You can go back to your laptops tonight and watch investment arbitrations running live or cached on YouTube or elsewhere if you so desire. I actually was one of the arbitrators in the the Philip Morris versus Uruguay case, which attracted, <laughs> which attracted enormous press attention. You can't believe how much press attention this attracted. We went to the ICSID headquarters in Washington where the hearings were to be held on the first day. We went anticipating large crowds. The hearings were public. We went anticipating a crowd like this in the hearing room. The room looked like this room will look in two hours. <laughs> there was nobody there. Nobody came to watch. The criticisms of investment arbitration are not because it's not confidential, not because, it, because it's not transparent. It is transparent. It's not confidential. 
The criticisms are for another reason. The criticisms are because the critics don't like international law because it interferes with state sovereignty. The freedom of states to do what they want. That's why they pretend they don't like arbitration. Next question. Uh, in the very back. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering what were, what were your thoughts on commercial courts such as the Singapore International Commercial Court in relation to arbitration? One of the developments that has occurred over the last, thank you, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, one of the developments that has occurred over the last five, ten years has been the development of specialized commercial courts. In a, in a sense, this is these types of courts have, have always existed. Courts in England, in Turkey, where there's a specialized construction court, um, in in New York, where there's specialized courts to deal with particular matters. So there have always been, in a sense, specialized courts that that attempt to deal with particular subject matters. In many countries, it doesn't work quite as well as it's advertised, or nearly as well as as it's advertised. But but there have been efforts, of course, to to create institutions, courts, that deal specifically with, with international commercial disputes. Now, in Singapore and, and the Netherlands, um, more specific efforts recently have been adopted to establish national courts that are, in a sense, international. And one of the interesting aspects of these courts in, in Singapore, the Singapore International Commercial Court, SICC, um, and in, in the Netherlands, a, a, an English-speaking court that, that is, is aimed specifically at, at um, international commercial disputes. One of the interesting things, one of the curious things about, about these courts is that they try as hard as they can to be like arbitration. Um, they allow for the, a, a case-by-case -case development of specific procedures as opposed to the one-size-fits-all application of local domestic rules of, of civil procedure. They allow for the selection of specialized judges, in the case of the SICC, even a, a specialized panel of judges who are different from, apart from the Singaporean judiciary. And in that sense, SICC is, is, for example, different from the English commercial court, where you have traditional English judges applying traditional English civil procedure rules. In Singapore, you have a new body of judges applying a new set of procedures. And it looks as much like arbitration as, as one can, can hope to, to be. And I think that's revealing in a sense. Uh, I think it reveals the, the truth of the five E's that I, that I spoke about, the importance of those values, because these new institutions seek to be as much like international arbitration as, as they can be. I think the jury is still out, if I can mix my metaphors, on whether these these international courts will, will succeed. I think if what you want is arbitration, the benefits of arbitration, then the obvious choice is to agree to arbitrate instead of agreeing to resolve disputes before a court that looks mostly like arbitration but isn't actually critically as well international arbitration continues to enjoy the benefits of the New York Convention, the ability to recognize arbitration agreements and arbitral awards in 160, 165 countries around the world, the Hague Convention for the uh, choice, of, choice of court agreements um, is still in its infancy. There are significant architectural flaws in it, and I suspect it will remain in its infancy for, for some time, perhaps forever. Um, and at least while that happens, arbitration continues very clearly to enjoy benefits of enforceability that, that the commercial courts cannot, cannot possibly compete with. I think we're getting close to the, perhaps we take one more question and then we can move to the alcohol that is <laughs> foreseen. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about the, pro the process of selection of arbitrators. Do you think that should, should the, it should change or not? Or, um, Maybe, for instance, the, what Jan Paulson advocates about is the ending with the arbitrators selected by the parties and get all the arbitrators being selected by the institutions. Jan didn't read the French Constitution, <laughs> and he should have. Mr. Paulson has championed an idea, 
I think it's an idea. I'm not sure, actually, what I think about it. Is champion the suggestion that there be no party nominated co arbitrators in international arbitration because he thinks that party nominated co arbitrators are biased. They inevitably tilt towards the party that nominated them and that that's a bad thing. That, I think, broadly stated is his argument. His views. He's been joined by Albert Jan Vandenberg, who voices similar conclusions. He did, Professor Vandenberg did a study of arbitral awards and arrived at the stunning conclusion that in 15% of all cases there were dissents and that in most of those instances the dissents were by a co-arbitrator who had been nominated by the losing party. This was an aha. I had discovered that co-arbitrators tilt towards the party that nominated them. Those are really curious views, both in light of history, the French Constitution, practical reality, and in my view, sound, reliable decision making. They ignore history because since those cuneiform tablets we began by looking at, arbitration has involved the very simple, uncomplicated means of selecting tribunals. One party chooses one arbitrator. The other party chooses another arbitrator. The two co-arbitrators attempt to, and often do, select the presiding arbitrator. And if they can't, an entirely neutral arbitral institution does so. That has worked since the cuneiform tablets. You can go back to ancient Greek treaties, to medieval um, land deeds, or agreements between principalities in Europe, to early treaties between the United States and Great Britain, to virtually every set of institutional arbitration rules since the 1920s. And you will see precisely that same mechanism. Because it's simple and reliable and most importantly, because, and this moves to the second reason, it gives effect to one of the most important aspects of arbitration, the party's right to resolve their dispute by arbitrators of their choosing. And the choosing comes when the parties choose, each party choosing, a co-arbitrator. And that's a fundamentally important aspect of both participating in the process, but also ensuring that the tribunal is the best decision maker for this dispute because who knows better than anyone else in the world what the party's dispute concerns and who has more incentive than anyone else in the world to make the right choice about the tribunal, you know, the parties, right? I am the president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center. I appoint lots of arbitrators every year. I don't do as good a job as the parties themselves when they choose arbitrators because there's no way that I or any other institutional head, institutional court, can make a decision on behalf of the party because of the access to information and because of the incentives to make good choices. Now, is it true that co-arbitrators tilt in favor of the party that appointed them? Of course. <laughs> you must be a child to think otherwise. Do you really think someone's going to go out and pick somebody who constitutionally doesn't like their arguments or lacks any expertise in their field or won't be from the perspective of legal views and experience and language and culture receptive to their arguments? Of course not. And that's, in fact, part of the reason that you have party nominated co arbitrator Is that a criticism of the system? And it hasn't been for 4,000 years. It wasn't in the French Constitution. It hasn't been in the hundred years since arbitral institutions began publishing rules after the Geneva Protocol, because it worked. Does it produce a biased tribunal? No. You have two party nominated co-arbitrators who work together, in my experience, in the overwhelming majority of cases to produce a much more nuanced result. And this comes, in a sense, to, to the, the third of the reasons that I mentioned, a more reliable dispute resolution process. We, all of us, we're ordinary people, right? We're lazy. We're especially lazy if, like many arbitrators, we're paid a lump sum based on the amount of dispute. 
if there's a killer email or provision in the statutory code that resolves the case just super easy and you can write a seven page award, it's so tempting, <laughs> right? You want an easy, clean result. The thing about co-arbitrators is they avoid that kind of group think. The thing about co-arbitrators is they're the ones, when you go back into deliberation, say, actually, that code provision doesn't apply because of this decision and this other decision. We can't rely on it. And there'll be discussion about that, and sometimes the co-arbitrator will be right, and sometimes it'll be wrong. But the important thing is the co-arbitrator does not take the easy way out. The co-arbitrator engages proactively in a process that requires his or her views to be scrutinized. That is a laser. It's a process that ensures that the result actually takes into account all the interests, all the relevant information, all the relevant legal provisions. In my experience, it produces much more nuanced decisions. I'd much rather be a member of a three-person tribunal than a sole arbitrator. Because then I'm not tempted to be lazy. And then I am challenged or assisted by the views of the other co-arbitrators. I think it's a process, actually, that is one of the main benefits of arbitration. I'm not sure quite why Mr. Paulson and Mr. Vandenberg chose to attack this. It may be that one gets lots of attention, not as much attention as one does with really good special effects, but one gets attention. I think that was the last question. As I promised, there's alcohol. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you